and the manager of Vancouver T uh, Detox, then Mosaic and Success. And throughout the 40 years of being a social worker, Paul was well respected by his colleagues, supervisors, and students. He went above and beyond what the job required uh, because Paul, for Paul, social work was not just a job, it was a calling. It's the ability to make a positive difference in the lives of others. So when um, a boat full of Fujian Chinese refugees arrived on the shore of British Columbia in 1999, Paul was the first to respond to this crisis of human trafficking. He worked day and night to help with the immediate needs and continued the months that followed in terms of their uh, settlement. And um, you know, Paul was awarded the uh, Gold Award from the Public Service Employee Relations Community for his service to the public in such an extraordinary um, and unprecedented situation. And as a social work supervisor, he really believed in the importance of connection and the relational aspect of the work. Over his career, Paul supervised a number of international exchange students and he spent a lot of time with the students, not just on the job, but also on the weekends, showing them around, um, having them uh, settle into Vancouver and living the life within Vancouver and what that, um, what that meant. And students called him the best teacher in the world. And even in his passing, many former students from years past traveled afar to celebrate his life. Paul was an inspiration to all the lives that he touched. His life exemplified what a social worker could achieve and he believed really firmly in the ripple effect and where a positive change and inspiration can be passed on from one person to another and in another. So in memory of Paul Chang, this Inspiring Social Work of the Year Award has been established to highlight those who live the passion of the social work calling and to continue that ripple effect that uh, once shined bright in Paul Chang's life. So with that, uh, this year's Inspiring Social Work of the Year Award goes to Tara Ross and I'd like to invite her to come and Diane for us to um, share the plaque for her. <laughs> Let me this way. We'll take some pictures. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, as part of um, being uh, selected as the Inspiring Social Work of the Year Award, uh, we have Tara Ross. Um, giving the uh, Paul Chang Memorial Lecture, and so I'll invite her to provide her lecture Thanks. now. I'll let you go. Down. There is some water. Oh, thank you. I'll just drink from the bottle. I'm just going to make sure I have some water just in case. How's that mic? Is that good? Oh, I'll have to turn on this one. There we go. Nice and loud now? Okay. Thank you. It's such an honor to be here today and receive this award and to be invited to share my story with you. Social workers historically got on the elevator last and allowed doctors on first. This was a takeaway message I got from an article I read about hospital social work prior to my MSW internship in palliative care. I was disheartened. And I was fully prepared to be treated as though I was the least valuable team member on the interdisciplinary healthcare team. Much to my surprise, this was not my experience. In fact, social workers were very highly regarded within the team I was placed in. We were asked for our clinical impressions at daily huddles, invited on home visits with nurses and doctors, and we implemented new team-based initiatives to improve patient care. We laughed and joked and ate lunch together as equals. I felt like I belonged on the team, even being a student, and I thought perhaps this power hierarchy that the author described had been flattened over time or wasn't such an issue in Australia where I was studying, or perhaps it was a fluke Maybe this is a very special team, since the head physician was actually married to a social work professor. So he had some extra knowledge 
of the value of social work. Imagine my surprise when I worked in another community health role, primary care back in Canada at this point, and again, social work, was held, social work was held in extremely high regard, not only by the physicians, but by other allied health as well. So why are social workers in high demand to work in interdisciplinary healthcare teams? Because we are unique problem solvers. We are boundary spanners. We can improve health outcomes where it matters most, the social determinants of health. Social work evolved out of the efforts of volunteers caring for vulnerable people in our communities. The focus on social circumstance is our superpower. And now we have research to support that our profession's early efforts were stunningly important for health. Social determinants of health have been shown to have greater influence on health than either genetic factors or access to healthcare services. Patients' physical and mental health is influenced by many factors, including life experience, employment, race, and other social and economic conditions in which we live. Not by chance, these social conditions are inequitable. People have different access to education, safe housing, income, fresh food, and other needs that influence their health outcomes. The Canadian Facts by McConnell provides a really comprehensive review. But just for an example, looking at the impact of income, men in the wealthiest 20% of neighborhoods in Canada live on average five years longer than men in the poorest 20% of neighborhoods. And for women, it's a difference of two years. Heart disease, adult onset diabetes, and respira respiratory disease are far more common among low-income Canadians. So social inequities contribute to health inequities. Linda Martinez from Boston University writes extensively about the role of social workers in healthcare. She speaks of social workers being trained to navigate these multiple dimensions that influence health. And as boundary spanners, we facilitate communication amongst healthcare providers and community partners that can offer resources for a patient's treatment plan. We span professional silos through the process of advocating. Social workers employ a person in environment approach to meet people in non-traditional settings, creating access for the most marginalized people in our population and for those who might not otherwise access care. Martinez writes that as boots on the ground, social workers have valuable insight and familiarity that can make all the difference in delivering effective care that addresses individuals' unique needs. As Nobel Prize winning social worker Jane Annamans once wrote, social workers' special genius is in its closeness to the people it serves. I have a few such experiences to share that were documented in a review of the East Kootenai Social Work Program in 2019. I need to first explain that the program was still in its early stages. We did not have ongoing funding. I think we could fairly say it was still a pilot. We were essentially in the creation stages of this role. We were self-managing healthcare teams. The social workers were employees of the local First Nation. Other allied health professionals were health authority employees. The doctors were usually in self-employed situations in private clinics, with the exception of some health authority or First Nations managed clinics. So the implementation of the social work role included figuring out how to insert ourselves into this established dynamic, creating a team amongst professionals who worked for different employers. So I'm going to highlight a few, a few points from this review that you might find interesting. First, we learned that impromptu or less formal communication and in-person communication between providers was the most efficient. So social workers catching physicians between appointments, for example. We literally would stake them out, outside treatment rooms, and sort out issues in about 30 seconds to a minute, plus our waiting time. This is important because traditionally, the main way of communicating in health is actually through faxes. 
So to underscore the impromptu and informal communication, I need to underscore that this impromptu and informal communication is actually groundbreaking. And I'm hoping that most of you have at least used a fax machine or know about their existence. Okay, <laughs> I really hadn't sent a fax before I started working in a doctor's clinic. Second, the number one factor that influences whether social workers felt part of the team is whether they spend time and see patients in the clinic. So this highlights one of the barriers in implementing the program was lack of office space. And to be honest, it's been a bit of a sub-theme of my career is, is finding space. So some social workers need to see patients off-site or in the community, in the patient's home. So in general, those social workers that had a regu regularly scheduled day at the clinic and therefore were be able to have lots of face-to-face -face time with the physicians and other providers felt that they were part of the team. And feeling included in the clinical team was enhanced by good communication between the other healthcare providers, the location of the office, so if they had an office in the back of the clinic, they felt less included, and whether they were invited to clinic functions, so staff meetings and clinic social functions, and the number of care providers that actually referred to them. So if more providers in the clinic referred to the social worker, the more they felt part of the team. Some of the things that the clinics have done to achieve success is some of the basics. Introducing the social worker and it to as many physicians as possible when the social, work start, social worker started, including them in staff functions, inviting the social worker to join in home visits, and having regular case conferences. And in those situations where there wasn't enough office space, still ensuring that social workers felt welcome to attend the clinic, to meet with physicians and other healthcare providers. I will now share my favorite part, which is the impact of the social work program on patients. Patients greatly appreciated the time that the social workers had to work with them. And that the social workers worked to really understand what was going on in their lives. By working with the social workers, patients often felt that they could take more control and become part of their own health care plan. Patients appreciated having someone to help them navigate systems that can be very hard to navigate and inaccessible to some patients. They expressed that they felt understood and supported by social workers. One social worker said that a patient once told her that what she did for them was life-changing. This is also my, my second favorite part, about the impact of social workers on the physicians. The social workers often heard from physicians about how helpful the program was for them. It's because we can effectively and efficiently undertake processes for the patients that the physicians simply do not know how to do and they don't have the time to do. The social workers believe that their work reduced physician stress because without solving a patient's social issue, the physician may not be able to completely treat the patient. For example, when a patient can't afford their medication. It is also believed that the social work program helped physicians have a better understanding of how social issues can have a significant effect on a person's health. A clinical supervisor once told me that social work can appear invisible in healthcare teams because we do tend to work behind the scenes. I prefer the term magical rather than invisible. At times, it can seem that we make problems disappear as we tackle the impossible, working under time pressure to help sort out the most complex circumstance at times. Sometimes it's like one day there's a massive crisis and then by the next day's huddle, the social worker has managed to resolve it with the patient. Social workers in primary care work to reduce administrative barriers by introducing the client to the right resource, circumventing processes at times, advocating, and by just being present to witness another person's distress. Showing care. We help patients get to medical appointments via finding funding for airfare and hotel. We increase monthly income by completing applications to persons with disability, address food insecurity by linking clients with food programs. When housing is at risk, 
we work with patients and community providers to find a new home or apply for subsidized housing. We address systemic racism by practicing in culturally safe ways. When basic needs such as food, housing, income is at risk constantly, or people are experiencing the impact of generations of racism, people experience chronic stress. McConnell explains simply that chronic stress impacts our phys physiology in negative ways, leading to biological changes and ultimately disease. We also behave differently under stress, sometimes adopt unhealthy ways of coping through alcohol or drugs. Stressful living conditions also make it difficult to take up social and leisure activities that bring us pleasure and impact health positively. People spend most of their energy just getting through the day. As a profession, social work has long recognized this relationship between individuals and their broader social system and the importance of caring, of social connection to improve well-being. Sometimes there isn't anything we can really do to solve the problems someone's experiencing and our role is simply to help them process emotionally and bring a new understanding of a way to live with their circumstance, whether it be a new diagnosis or a difficult situation. Now and since its inception, social workers play a critical role in advancing public health and eradicating these health inequities for future generations. I'm glad I took the get on the elevator last article with a pinch of salt because I've always felt valued in healthcare. I'll also add they can't reference this article because I've lost access to my student portal. <laughs> so download everything you want off it before you graduate. <laughs> I've looked everywhere because I think about it often because it scared me to think I was maybe going into a, a placement where I wasn't going to be treated well, treated equally. I'm also grateful and I do recognize that it's the social workers before me working in healthcare that flattened this, hier this hierarchy. So yeah, I'm full of gratitude for the social workers before me working not only in healthcare but in all the other areas that we've worked. I was asked for, to speak for also today for a few minutes about what motivates me to continue to learn and grow and how I've managed to work in challenging work environments, like the primary care role that I've been describing here today. So for me, I'm motivated by the inherent diversity and constant change in social work. I genuinely enjoyed being part of a creation of a new role in the field of social work. I think that most seasoned social workers would agree that no clients are ever the same. There's always something to learn and new ideas emerging about how to best help people. As society shifts and grows, so do social workers. I also create change. I recently moved to work in community mental health. I'm deepening my skill set while still carrying a health equity lens. I have a generalist varied caseload, which demands constant learning. I take a deeper dive into learning about various aspects of challenging mental health conditions. I conduct both group therapy and individual work, and I've been learning new modalities of therapy. The diversity of my day-to-day -day role keeps me curious, challenged, and motivated to learn more. Lastly, I was asked to share some advice for practitioners to help themselves continue to be able to provide quality practice. I'm not sure I actually have advice here. Our jobs can be tough, and we can work in challenging environments. I will share what I think of when supporting myself, and perhaps some will find this helpful. When caring for people, it can be challenging at times not to think about work when not at work. It's always challenging to create balance between work and the rest of my life. Early in my career, a colleague taught me to create a visualization when I heard something really hard or emotive. At the end of a session or end of the day, imagine putting those images and feelings in a box in your office and leaving them there. I still use mindfulness skills to manage my work thoughts and feelings in various ways. I've also relied on my social work lens to protect me against burnout. Carl Rogers spoke of the importance of unconditional positive regard. Social workers have unconditional positive regard for the dignity of the human being. I see people as strong and resilient, who have survived despite enormous challenge, and who don't need to be rescued. To attempt to rescue is not helpful, 
it is disrespectful to assume that we can actually rescue someone and likely to result in practitioner burnout. Social work theory teaches us that supporting people instead to access their own resources and skills and meeting them where they're at is a much more helpful concept. When I start to feel stress, I use reflective practice to check in with myself. I ask myself, how is the rest of my life? Am I coming to work refreshed Monday morning? If not, what's getting in my way? How is my nutrition, my sleep, my exercise? How is my social connection? What might be getting in the way of me feeling my best? What changes might I need to make? Is it taking a lunch break? Leaving on time? Reducing other commitments outside of work? Is there a situation at work that I really need to address? Do I need some clinical supervision? We don't need to know everything as social work, social workers. We don't have to be perfect. But I do feel it's important that we're applying skills in our, to our own lives and leading by example. We can't teach or counsel clients with skills we haven't honed ourselves. This value to lead by example is probably my primary motivator to keep learning and growing in my career. Social work is a big, challenging, important job. I recently read that essential skills include empathy, authenticity, resilience, and respect. These skills help us cope with situations and meet the needs of our clients. However, the best coping mechanism in social work is definitely humor. Finding humor in situations that stress you out releases endorphins and makes you feel better about the situation. I will close with my favorite Victor E. Frankel quote that I try to live by and share most frequently with my clients. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Thank you for having me today.